So I comments, hello everyone, how's it going? And uh, welcome back to continue uh, chapter number nine. And as we have went through in chapter number nine about relief valves, the type of relief valves, and uh, we talked about the relief valve, safety valve, and the relief safety valve. Relief valve for liquid, safety valve for gases, relief safety valves for both if you have the possibility of relieving uh, something which is liquid or gas. And after we have taken that and we have taken the different types uh, of the ruptured disc and the spring one or the billow if you have a lot of pressure and uh, we, we need to go now and find uh, about more information of information about the scenarios scenario is just a story right you are just going to uh, you need that the one with the black hat that who says that well there are many problems here i can see okay so he's that has this eye where he sees all bad things that could happen uh, and in the sense that every possible dangerous or, or sorry over pressure thing that could happen in any place so a scenario is a description of one specific relief event usually each relief has more than one relief event and worst case scenario is a scenario or, or event that requires the largest relief vent area so the worst case scenario is the largest relief vent area now, just talking about the scenarios, not the worst scenarios, ex ex examples of relief events are what? A pump is deadheaded. Okay, so the pump relief is sized <coughs> to handle the full pump cap capacity as it's rated pressure. So just giving that a pump is deadheaded is one of the things that could be a problem. The same pump relief is in line with a nitrogen regulator. The relief is sized to handle the nitrogen if the regulator fails. So yeah, we are, you see, we are putting a scenario and we are putting like a solution for that scenario. <coughs> Sorry. The same pump is connected to a heat exchanger with live steam. Uh, so, so, so we could have a problem, right? We have live steam, and uh, which is also, which is connected to a heat exchanger. Imagine that this, this pump goes on and pumps steam and steam and steam and this heat exchanger gets heated up. The relief is sized to handle steam injected into the exchanger under uncontrolled condition. For example, a steam regulator failure. So I have a regulator failure for the steam valve instead of giving us a lot of steam. So I need some kind of a valve to relieve steam uh, if there's any failure in that regulator. Okay, so these are like you're putting scenarios and you're putting uh, solutions for it. So now let's go to the example and, and actually the example that we had uh, went through uh, in our figures <clears throat> and I think so it's up, up there in our presentation. So PSV1 and PSV1B vessel full of full of liquid and pump one accidentally actuated. Okay, so uh, I, I, uh, let me bring on the figure so that it will be easier for us to, to discuss it. So here is PSV1A and here is PSV1B and, and if you can recall we said that vessel full of liquid and pump P1 is accident, accidentally actuated and, uh, and, and uh, here are the P2 PSVs. Is this related to this one here? Uh, let, let, let me make sure. Uh, cool, cooling coil is broken and water enters at a certain temperature um, and a, a certain flow rate and pressure. So where is the cooling water? Here is the cooling water. I have cooling water in and cooling water out. And that was, aha, uh, uh -huh, okay. So what you are saying that? We are saying that if the vessel is full of liquid and P1 is, is, is pumping, if cooling coil is broken so and water enters, so imagine all this happened together. And, and a scenario that also nitrogen regulator fails, uh, that means I have no inerting, loss of cooling during reaction, run away. So the main thing I'm saying that here, I have a lot of liquid and I have also uh, 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 an accumulation of vapors. I have heating that will not stop. I have no cooling. What will happen? PSV and PSV1 will be working, okay? So I'm putting all the scenarios that could happen. V1 is accidentally closed, okay? And, and system needs relief. So let's see V1, where is V1 is accidentally closed, okay? V1 here, 
So if this is closed, what will happen? This should be working, right? Because if this is closed, it's like pumping, pumping, this will heat up and it will blow, right? So you need a, a relief system here. Of course, pumps, they are designed so that if they have this kind of thing, where it pumps and nothing goes on, it could go off by itself. Okay, so what else? Confined water line is heated with, uh, with the steam. Okay, so PSV3 is going to be working and the confined <coughs> water, uh, where is that, sorry? That is uh, PSV3 and PSV3 is up here, yep. So it happens that this is the water and of course it is cooling up the system and this cooling it comes up to the hot water uh, because that it is heated and maybe it is heated really high uh, with that uh, and we need a, an, an, a valve, a relief valve there. Again, this is another scenario for PSV4 if the nitrogen fails and the other R1 scenarios, these happen. Okay, so we have PSV1. Uh, PSV5, if the water blocked inside the coil and the heat of reaction causes thermal expansion. So what do we have here? We have this cooling is, is not happening because there's a problem with the cooling water in and, and, uh, and because of that, the heat is building up inside here. So, so I think so we already went through all these examples, but what you are trying to say here, we already went through all the scenarios before, but we are saying that there is a terminology where we, we name it as a relief scenario and based on the scenarios, we are making sure that all our relief valves that were identified, they, they will do the good work for all these scenarios. Otherwise, we may need to add more safety valves, okay? So you put your safety valve on all possible places that you have overpressure and then you put the scenarios and make sure that this works with all scenarios. So what do we have here? It's like we are having a system after the relief type has been chosen and the relief size computed. Of course, we, we did not go through sizing, but yeah, if, if we do go through this, then the engineer takes the responsibility to complete the design of the relief system, including this, deciding how to install the relief uh, in the system and how to dispose the e existing liquids and vapor. So, so talking about now we have a good relief system it's, uh, it may not be enough because we need to install it right and properly. Because what? Regardless of how carefully relief is sized, specified and tested, a poor installation can result in completely unsatisfactory relief performance. So we need to be careful that we have a good installation. And in this case, uh, I need to zoom in here, just to zoom in, okay? So what do we mean by that? So uh, let's take many examples. Uh, a rupture disc in corrosive surface. So we know that if it is corrosive surface, consider a rupture disc and not to bring a, bring a spring one where the spring is going to be damaged with this corrosive material. Of course, we're going to also use that for highly toxic materials or for highly toxic materials where spring-loaded valve may weep. Okay, so if you're worried about your spring-loaded valve, just put, it, uh, put a, 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 a rupture disc uh, to prevent this highly toxic material from weeping that spring-loaded valve. Or you could have what? Two rupture discs in extremely corrosive service. The first may periodically need to be replaced. So one will be replaced because it is a very corrosive material. It will, it will damage that, that uh, rupture disc, right? And because of, of, of it's like this corroded, corroded or corrosive material is corroding it. It's eating that disc, if I would say. Uh, till it just opens, this will fail, and then the second one will be saying that I'm ready for it now. Until you maintain the first one, and then, okay, you go like that. What else do I have? The rupture disc and spring-loaded relief. Normal relief may go through spring-loaded device. Okay, so what do you have? You have a relief here, which goes through a spring-loaded device. And the rupture disc is a backup for larger relief. So there's a larger relief. Now who's going to do take the job? My rupture disc is going to take the job. What else do I have from uh, different installation uh, uh, shapes or, or style? Two reliefs in series. And we already had this example, two reliefs in series. 
Uh, and there is, the reason is this rupture disc is protecting the, the bigger one. So the rupture disc protects against toxicity and corrosion. The spring-loaded relief closes and minimizes losses. Okay, so this will rupture. Of course, uh, just think of it if I don't have this, okay? If I don't have this, if I don't have this thing here. So if I don't have it, what will happen? Uh, the corrosive material will try, it will corrode now my spring thing, right? And then my piston as well, which is very expensive actually. And, and uh, why to do this? Just protect it through a rupture one. And if it opens, now my spring will open to get rid of that uh, release. And then it closes. And then we were going to change this rupture disc. By that, my spring loaded is only in a few seconds or few minutes is in contact with this corrosive material rather than it being in contact uh, continuously with this corroded material okay now you could have two rupture discs in that sense here with special valve which keeps one valve always directly connected to the vessel this type of design, why do we do it? Is good for polymerization react, uh, reactors where periodic cleaning is necessary. So you need to do, uh, why, why, do, why do you need periodic cleaning? Think of it, you want to produce a polymer which is very sticky, uh, say for example, paints. So if you have a paint here inside this, uh, uh, this reactor here, you want to clean it, right? And, 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 and the, uh, since you need periodic cleaning, so you, sometimes you need one to connect it to one of it and, and, and do the cleaning. Uh, of course, we use cleaning like whatever. Water is not good for cleaning formalization reactors. Uh, you could use some kind of acetone that is a little bit expensive, but there are some other ways of how to clean the inside of that reactor. So you keep one of them always ready, uh, connected uh, 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 to the vessel. Okay, so these are the systems that we have. Not only that, we have off even more. And let's zoom in again and see what else do we have. Pressure drop, not more than 3% of set pressure. So we don't have a big pressure drop here. We have a long radius elbow, okay, and C, See, if distance is greater than 10 feet and reaction forces, and uh, here this, this distance C, okay? If distance is greater than 10 feet weight and reaction forces should be supported below the long uh, radius uh, elbow. Uh, so what do we have here? So uh, th this is one kind of an arrangement for a system. So if you have kind of an arrangement where the pressure drop is not more than uh, 3% and then you have an elbow uh, later that goes to another system here and this is about 10 w feet uh, 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 because if you have like a high distance here and it, it may go back right you have a backup pressure uh, so you need to consider all this uh, that you must have what you must have a relief valve uh, in this case of course you already said that you must have a relief valve uh, however, we were just mentioning that the pressure drop should not be more than 3% of the set pressure in this case because the my backup pressure would affect. Okay, so you need to consider this uh, if you have something like an elbow later. What else? If you have a pipeline and you have an, uh, a, a single safety relief in this vapor service, <clears throat> it should not exceed 2% of this cross sectional area. So if you have a cross sectional area, if you have a cross sectional area, right uh, so if you have a cross-sectional area here okay so now I need to zoom back so if you have a cross-sectional area we are saying that and my uh, my orifice area of the safety relief should not exceed 2% of this <coughs> cross-sectional area of the protected line okay uh, because you're simply saying that if you do this it, maybe it will open and never, never close okay uh, it will just may cause that it will open and open and I mean this pipe with the pressure that it has it will go out and it may not be less why because you're always having things flowing in that pipe <clears throat> okay uh, what else do we have uh, if we have a vessel like that and we have an inlet <coughs> inlet here uh, line process line should not be connected 
to safety valve inlet piping. So if this is my safety valve inlet piping, okay, if this is my safety valve inlet piping, so process line should not be connected to safety valve. I should not put any safety, sorry, process line. What else do I have? If I have a device, turbulence causing device A, <clears throat> and later I have, after this turbulence device, I have like uh, uh, regulator valves, uh, this is the number of, of those valves, uh, of, uh, so, uh, uh, we have two elbows or bends, not in the same plane, two elbows or bends in the same plane, and, uh, and so if you have this kind of arrangement later after uh, this uh, turbulence device, so you're expecting that because of the turbulence device, you will have here a lot of turbulence, maybe also a gas as well, and so you need a safety, you need a safety valve here. <clears throat> so that, these are what, these are relief installation practices. We can use those practices from the experience that people had uh, and uh, just make use of them. Great, so what do we have? Uh, here mainly after I have talk, talked about the relief installation uh, practices, you only need now to talk about the design considerations just to make it inherent and here we, we will start talking about the codes as well because there is a lot of codes that comes into our mind when we talk about the design consideration when you do come to some kind of uh, relief system so so the first thing that i want to uh, mention here the design of a relief system must be familiar with the government cause so any designer if you are the designer please consider the governmental cause because whatever you're going to uh, export, uh, what you're going to emit uh, uh, into this atmosphere, what you're going to emit into atmosphere, uh, you should be careful that it should be within the regulations for environmental that's in your place. And there are lots of codes that are published by the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, the American Petroleum Institute, and the National Board of Fire Underwriters. So you can look at that uh, by yourself. Or, so if, we, if, if you just want to see, the, these are the ASME, the API, they are very popular, and the MBFU, right? Okay, so go look at them, you're going to find them. It's important to recognize that company philosophy uh, will also add at for in the design of reliefs okay the company philosophy and the regulatory authorities uh, in your country have a significant influence in the design of the final disposal so you want to dispose something but maybe your policy has something more strict okay so for example we have gpic it has some additional policies just to protect environment it's like it, it is co its contribution to the, this value rather than it's only being a regulation by the government. For this reason, reliefs are now really vented to atmosphere. Now, and that is why now things are really not thrown, disposed. They are treated before they are disposed. Most cases, a relief is, is first discharged to a knockout system. So now you're talking about water treatment. That is not a relief valve. That is like we are <clears throat> trying to dispose one of the utility, we are using water for something and now it is dirty, it's contaminated, I was going to throw it to the sea. I, I must not throw it, I need to deal and treat, treat it. But that's not a relief. A relief is something like an overpressure <clears throat> and now it's discharged. But when discharging, it could go to the atmosphere or it is commonly going to a knockout system to separate the liquid from the vapor and here the liquid is collected and the vapor is discharged to another treatment unit. So, so there is a way of in a how we, we can deal with this uh, contaminant when it is relieved and, and it goes to a knockout system. The knockout is like a knockout with someone hitting a box and falling down. So it knocks out this relief and says stop and it stops. And, and, and then you treat it, okay? You treat it. <laughs> you treat the, the guy who fell down from the knockout. Okay, the, so the, this subsequent vapor treatment unit depends on the hazards of the vapor, of course. We will not dispose anything which is hazardous. It may include a condenser. So instead of adjusting a knockout system, we may have a condenser uh, later uh, to, to take out, to do some kind of treatment or a scrubber, uh, some kind of adsorption, for example, incinerator, cleaning, flare, 
uh, burning it where it, where it before it goes out to the atmosphere or any combination of all these all these types is called a total contaminant system this type system is called total contaminant system okay one is illustrated in figure 911 we are going to see that total contaminant systems are commonly used and they are becoming under status standard so what do we have we are saying that uh, in this in this slide consider governmental code these are the people that you want to read for them uh, because government uh, we governmental codes depend on these to write their codes uh, or they do mention them in their codes as well and uh, the philosophy of the company will also have its input and the regulatory authorities in your country like the environmental uh, authority we have in Bahrain uh, what else most cases it's it's taking to a knockout system okay just to knock it out and then treat it and then treat it if you're talking about treatment you need a total contamination system where you can use a condenser scrubber a combination of these uh, all of them okay so this is the design consideration that you need to consider in your system and that is figure 9 in heaven the one that i had just spoken about that that's a relief contaminant system with the blow drum uh, and, and separates vapor from liquid so it just goes to a drum simply a drum boom okay comes here boom okay you just stop it with a big drum and and and, and it just stops there and of course with this it drops off pressure and you have gases here and you have of course liquid here and and this gas you may take it to the flare or you you, you condense to condenser or scrubber absorption absorption where you work with it and that is a very similar thing where we have a reactor it goes out here and what do you do you knock it out or a catch tank here's the knockout drum you're catching out the liquid and you're having the vapor going up to a scrubber or a flare system flare is the flare where you fire you have a fire at the top uh, it, it, you have a fire here you see that when you go to scare you have fire up so that is the flare stack that you would have you can calculate uh, the, the, the velocity actually you can calculate the dropout velocity within that knockout uh, system that you have and and here uh, the, if you go back to the design method for sizing uh, which was published by Grossel and, and that is the number eight was the reference number I just kept it there uh, and in API 521 you're going to see that in the American, American Preparatory Institute standard 521 where we the method is used to, to 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 measure or based on the maximum allowable velocity for minimizing the liquid entrainment so i want to know what is the maximum allowable velocity to minimize the liquid entrainment okay so again we can see here uh, uh, that how how we can calculate the uh, the dropout velocity so it is the velocity after the drop ha happened right after the dropout so what happens with the dropout uh, velocity we can see that it's a function of the diameter and of course the particle diameter we say that if it increases my dropout velocity will increase it's like you're having uh, <laughs> uh, something which is very small like a small kid running and getting inside a big room in one speed and you knock him out I mean, it's very diff it's, it's it's still not as easy as uh, it, it will be. It, it will be still moving, right? And you're having no, not very small particles. You have one big guy running, a fat guy, uh, and and you have less of them, only four or five. Uh, knocking them out is uh, it, uh, you can see that it's not easy. Uh, you have big diameters coming to you, boom, 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 right? So the dropout velocity will be a, a bigger dropout velocity okay so that if this is greater uh, that will be higher in this case okay uh, and so if the diameter of course will affect and uh, so bigger or smaller particles or denser or less dense of course that will also affect the movement right it affects the movement and if you think of it i don't need to explain that a lot because we can remember Reynolds number a Reynolds number which is rho dB over mu so it's a, 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 so we have the the rho and the 
uh, we have the density, you have the diameter, we have the velocity, we have the viscosity. All that would affect, of course, my dropout velocity, the velocity after it drops out. The only thing that we need to have here, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this comes from this, uh, from this Reynolds number, where I can uh, calculate the drag coefficient correlation. So this is a drag coefficient, rem uh, depending on what? Depending on the uh, Reynolds number square. So CRE square is equal to, so this is my number here that I want to calculate, is equal to this, this equation or this figure here, or this figure here. Okay, great. So just to know if we know how to use this equation here, we take an example. It's always easier. So determine the maximum vapor uh, velocity in our horizontal knockout run to drop out liquid particles with particle diameters of 300 micrometers where the vapor rate is 170 pounds per hour and we have the density in the vapor phase is 0.2, the density in the liquid phase is 30 and we have the mu uh, is equal to 0 0.01 centipoise and the particle diameter we already said is 300 uh, micrometers and and my uh, my my mu uh, is equal to 9.84 uh, 9 into 10 to the power minus 4 feet so to determine the dropout velocity uh, if you, if you can see all what i need from the dropout velocity is this equation here right i need this equation what I need, the G, the DP, I have the gravity, I have the diameter, I have the densities, I have also the density here. Or what I need is what? Is the dragon coefficient. The dragon coefficient, whatever you want to use this, this, this formula or you want to use the figure. Uh, so, uh, so I think you need to use both. So let's, let's see. Uh, the CRE square is equal to what? 0.95 into 10 to the power 8 into rho VDP, rho L minus rho V into mu V square and my mu v, I already have mu v here, 0 0.01. So 0 0.95 to the power eight centipoise square. What is my uh, centipoise uh, square? Uh, we already have the viscosity. And I think so I need just to, to make it smaller here just to see the numbers. Uh, so I have here uh, the centipoise square, I have 0 0.01, uh, the centipoise. I have also rho L minus rho V. You see rho L minus rho V. So this is 30 minus uh, rho V, which is 0 0.2, 30 minus 0 0.2. I have DP cube, right? The DP cube, where is my DP cube? It's 300 micrometers. Uh, and uh, 300 micrometers, we need to take that into feet. Okay, so you need some kind of conversion there. And you're going to put this DP cube, you can see it here, 9.84 into 10 pounds minus 4 feet, and then to the power 3. And then you multiply this by rho v, uh, rho v, which is here rho v, and rho v here is 0 0.2, so we have a 0 0.2, over what? Over mu v squared. And then my mu v squared, you have a 0 0.01 squared. So you put all the values, right? You put all your values here. And this is multiplied by what? by my no, 0.95 to 10th power 8, that's this side here. So this multiplied by that is equal to 5,394. Now having 5,394, things are looking good. So I go here, 5,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, and I go up here, and this looks like one point between one and two, right? Between a one and two, it's like 1.3. So getting 1.3, I substitute C, the dragon coefficient, 1.3, and after I, I do this, I'm going to find what? I'm going to find the velocity, which is 2.19, 2.19 feet per second. So uh, I can calculate my dropout velocity, the, drop, the velocity after it drops out. Okay, great. What else do we have in this chapter? The flares. You already have taken flares before. Uh, we talked about it, about the heat. So the object of the flare is to burn, burn the combustible uh, toxic gas. So you have here the flare goes out and that is the big flare that I have here. And actually we can calculate the height of that flare and we calculate, can calculate the diameter of also that flare. And we can know what effect of that flare. The effect that means if you have 2000 BTU, it will cause blisters, okay? And in 20 seconds, that much of heat causing blisters in five seconds. Uh, blisters is like something on your skin, and uh, that. Uh, 
uh, you need to see, look at it. I mean, it becomes really red and it's like uh, becoming uh, not only red, like it opens. It's not, it's, it's like an, it's not an open wound. It's, it's still closed, but it becomes really watery. Uh, so this is where you have blisters. Uh, if you have this amount of BTU vegetation, wood are ignited. And if you have this amount only, that, that is like a radiation. It could have, you, you could feel the big heat on you. So what we are trying to say here, uh, we know the effect of this flare, we can know the height, we can know the diameter. And we can cal cal calculate the height by the equation that we have here. Again, so what is the, why do we have flares? The objective of the flares to burn the combustible or toxic gas to produce combustion products that are not toxic to the atmosphere. The diameter of the flare must be suitable to maintain the suitable flame and to prevent a blowout. Uh, blow out which means the vapor velocity is greater than 20% of the sonic velocity which means that if it is that it could go to very very further place and that could be dangerous okay so you need to make sure that the diameter is suitable to maintain a stable flame we have a flame and a stable the, f the height of a flare is fixed on a basis on a heat generated and the resulting potential damage to equipment and humans so we fix the height the usual design criteria is that the heat intensity of the stack not to exceed 1,500 because if it exceeds, it causes this and that and that. It causes all these blitters or uh, harmful uh, or fire to vegetation and wood would be ignited. So not to have all these things, things that are happening here, we will have only solar radiation and the solar radiation, If you now I want to calculate what is the height of that flame uh, this is the height of the flame when I have the diameter here you can see the diameter here and the values the other values I know you don't know what are the other values uh, I did not include that okay just a second for you to see what are these other uh, meanings of uh, the, the the flow rates that we have and the heat the amount of heat just a second so here are uh, what we try to to explain what are what do these parameters exp mean exactly. So what is Q here? Uh, Q is the uh, 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 it is the flame or the the energy that I have the radiation. So this is what it says. The heat intensity, yes, that's the heat. It's called the heat intensity as a specific point of function of the heat generated, which is. Uh, the QF, the QF, and the emissivity, which is E, and the distance R from the flame, which is R here. So you want to calculate uh, the, the heat uh, intensity. Of course, the heat intensity, it depends, it will be more intense if you're closer, it will, it will be less intense if you're far further. And, and here we are going to as assume a flame height of about 120 to the diameter uh, of that flame, and the emissivity, uh, that depends on the molecular weight and, and, and the heating value of about 20,000 BTU per pound. If you do all this, you're going to get this equation here. But let us know what is the rest. HF is the, uh, is the height of the flare in, uh, in, in inches, in feet, sorry, as a function of the flare stack diameter, which is also in feet, and the desired heat intensity, which is QF, and at a distance of XF from the base of the uh, flare uh, with a molecular weight M and the vapor flow rate that we have, which is in mass flow rate QM. Now, you substitute all that, here you're going to find our HF, okay? So now you got an idea about what does that mean. And here is the problem. Uh, the stack height required to give a heat intensity of 1,500 BTU per hour per feet square at a distance of 410 feet uh, from the base of the flare. The flare diameter is 4 feet. The flare load uh, is 900, wow, 970,000 pounds uh, per hour and the molecular weight is 44. Uh, it depends on this hydrocarbon that we are trying to burn. And of course now you substitute all your numbers here. So it's like just simple substitution. Uh, and, uh, and having uh, all our numbers, uh, we will get that the height of the flame is 226 feet. Now, if you know what is the height of the flame, we can know the mass flow rate 
okay the mass flow at qm here the qm the flare load uh, so you can know the other numbers that you would like to know uh, if you know the height of the flame great so uh, uh, this was the part that was related to the flame uh, and so on uh, to the flare now there are, uh, as i told you that we are going to cover the part that is related which is in the book and so there are some other other parts which is also mentioned by AICHE and actually it repeats some of the knowledge so we are going to be really quickly on how we are going to go through those knowledge this part of in, uh, knowledge uh, but we will also mention that the, the other details about uh, about for example the standards that are being used the different way of looking at uh, the, the relief valves uh, the, uh, so we also go, going to go through that part as well you're going to enjoy this part so uh, be with us also in a moment so looking at uh, uh, again uh, uh, what what you're going to go through now is like a summary of what we have taken already okay so for relief systems you need to know about codes and standards uh, for, 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 for the environment and for the leaf valves that you're using and the type of pipes and of course you need uh, to, to know how to design the relief valves you need to, all the terminologies and what causes the overpressure and we we have mentioned many scenarios that cause overpressure so the relief devices we always say that it is the last line of defense before any catastrophic failure could happen so the function of course is to know the overpressure scenario and get rid of it or overcome it and to protect my equipment people and not to prove for, uh, to and not to lose any production or any material and not to cause any harm harmful uh, any harm to the environment what are uh, standards we already have seen some standards like AICHE and ACME and MBFU okay now the relief systems uh, in AICHE they, they mention them as open discharge and closed discharge open discharge that means it's relief to atmosphere and, and close discharge, you're, really, you're leaving it to flare. So this is another way of looking at relief systems. You know, we, we understand now what are they, but uh, we are talking about now a, a different way of looking at relief systems. They are like relieving to atmosphere and where it is non-toxic and non-combustible or it becomes non-toxic or it becomes non-combustible and, 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 uh, or it could be a close discharge what it's relieved to, 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 to flare. Uh, okay, well, uh, this one is not toxic and this one relieved to flare and we make sure that it's not toxic. Okay, so uh, we already have mentioned about the open discharge. We have taken many examples here. And what is this? This is like a spring. Okay, this is like a spring on a pipe. And we said that if we have a spring on a pipe, uh, we already mentioned that uh, the diameter of this this should be not more than two percent of this diameter here okay so if you can recall what we have taken before and and the closed discharge of course we have a flare head system and we already finished explaining the flare head system we just want to make sure that the hazard would make close discharge the most appropriate relief method but are not limited to to the following flammability so it's flammable toxic reactivity special hazards but actually, after you do the flaring thing, uh, burning it, maybe none of these would become flammable or none of it would be to become toxic. And this is like a flare stack that you have. But please consider that even that you have a spring, of course, you can see that here a rupture disc, that are a relief valve, relief valve, spring one, and they are collected all after this relief thing because pressure was very high here or the pressure was very high here or there's an overpressure here. And they open, they all go to a knockout drum before going to the what? To the flare stack. So the, you, and you know the drop off velocity, you calculate how much you drop off this and you knock it down. And then of course you're going to have gas. And you're going to have, of course, maybe liquid here when you need to collect the liquid as well. And then of course you send all the vapor, you burn it and make sure that it is within certain regulations and standard that you do not overcome. Uh, so what are codes and standard references? There's the OSHA standard. You need, you want to read more about it. 
some safety management of hazard chemicals and flammable and combustible liquids. There's an ASME for uh, the standards, American standards for mechanical engineer, engineers, and uh, this is for boiling pressure, for example, for power piping, for petroleum. Uh, why is API not mentioned here? API is really very important to mention. It should be mentioned here as well. Uh, the API standards, the American Petroleum Institute standards. We have the NFPA as well. We already mentioned that, and 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 sometimes there are some other specifications by the clients. Okay, here's the API. Okay, sorry. So you have the API. I thought that I moved it out for some reason. Uh, so you have recommended practices F520, 521, and so on. And each one of the practices mentions something. For example, this 520 mentioned the design installation of our relief valves. And this is a guide for pressure relief and depressurizing system 521. We already mentioned that in our last video. And we have some more, of course, standards, more standards for API related to, to uh, the relief valves. Okay, so the, the next we have is the work process for relief system design. So in the end the design, we already said that the, the most important thing that we need to understand the process and where do we have overpressure and we need to also then know the scenarios and then the main or the generic uh, advice is to put it on every vessel and every place that you feel that you have an overpressure. So you're going to evaluate where there's an overpressure, right? And, and then of course, you may need to do some kind of calculations to do the sizing, to do the kind of sizing, to calculation of flow and the device size, the relief device, and the piping considerations as well. Now, all of this is within chapter 10. So, and so this is the, the place where we are not covering the piping sizing and, uh, and, and the sizing of the valves. So that part that is not covered in our course because we're mainly concentrating on safety and, 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 those, and those will be like, and there is someone who will help you to do these kind of calculations. So you need, of course, to do the design process. You need to understand the energy balance and the mass balances and the flow diagrams is very important. You need to know where do you have your instruments and control systems so that you know how to put your, uh, your relief valves. And of course, you need an information about your equipment, your the pump curves, and, I, and, and of course, the control valve. Uh, the sizes, all of these are very important. Even the physical properties and how the thermal expansion could happen or an runaway reaction or, or something that is very hazardous or it is uh, flammable. Uh, uh, and of course, inlet and outlet of a high to a low pressure vessel could be an issue. So you need all this kind of data so that you need to know how to do the design. Uh, the, the relief device terminology, we already took this device terminologies. The set pressure is the pressure when it opens. And of course, we already have the burst pressure where the rupture disc is bursting. And the over pressure, which is the percentage of pressure over the set pressure. The accumulation is the percentage of the pressure of the, the maximum allowable workable pressure. Uh, we did not take the simmer, which is to do something with, the, with, the, with, with seeing and hearing. Uh, just because of this pressure thing, but we took the chattering, the chattering where it opens and closes, the valves opens and closes because of bad design, and mainly it is because of an oversized uh, relief valve, uh, and maybe it's because of the backup pressure that is in a big backup pressure, or the inlet losses exceeds 3% of the set pressure, which also causes that, or we have a broken balanced billows, and because it's broken, from the right or from the left, it opens here and there, here and there, and, and, and that's what happens. And we already took that terminology very similarly to what we have taken uh, before. So if you design a valve, uh, you design it, you know where is the operating pressure, you know where is the set pressure, where you, it will open, and that is the maximum allowable pressure, and you have in consideration the accumulation that could build on this maximum allowable pressure. And when it goes down, it goes about four percent down this is the, that that's where it can go down uh, and to reseat and the blow down pressure is when it reseats on the seat again uh, when it closes okay so these are the some terminologies where you can read more about uh, more about it okay so uh, 
what an example that you can have for the backup pressure here is so in this example you can see that that I have some kind of a, of course there's a buildup of pressure here over pressure and then it opens and and of course it goes to a knockout drum before it goes to the flare so that is my flare KO knockout drum and if you can see that uh, here we can have a buildup of pressure and this buildup of pressure adds to the, to to if I have a loss of of, of, of pressure here as well so the superimposed back pressure, uh, you can calculate this, which is 0.3 PSIG. Total bit built up back up pressure is 15 PSIG. So in this case, in this example, we are just showing that we have about a 15.3 PSI uh, gauge uh, pressure. And, and and this shows you that this could cause what? Could cause chattering. Okay, causes of overpressure, we already have taken many causes but it's good to see them again very quickly as a summary and uh, and to see that we are also looking at what AICH people from this their experience American institutes for chemical engineers tell us to do so if you have a blocked outlet like from a pump a closed outlet like heat is source on and you the, the, the cooling water is closed it's not moving thermal expansion of liquids because there's heating because there's no cooling so there's heating of what is inside the reactor and and there's a runaway reaction cooling or reflux failure so there's no good cooling there's no reflux so there's no separation there's no cooling the reflux also works like the cooling by the way for separation so there's no cooling uh, there's a utility failure compressor is not working or sorry utility uh, the, 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 the heating or cooling are not working, electricity problem, uh, instrument failures could be a control valve failure, right? Well, which is controlling the temperature and now temperature is shooting out and the pressure is shooting out. So the relief valve knows you need to shoot out as well. So heat from external fire as well from the sun and also could cause that. Any entrance to a vapor, a uh, very volatile fluid could cause that. A chemical reaction that's goes run away any abnormal fluid input could part of a contamination a black flow from downstream equipment it could happen that we have a black flow to any kind of uh, system failure uh, failure of internal pressure boundary heat exchanger rupture it could be a pipe rupture it could be a fractionation tower failure of the separation or heat is going up or pressure is building up and and so on or it could be part of start, start up or shut down condition that was not correctly done, so you have an overpressure. So now talking about for vessels designed for less than 15 PSI uh, gauge, there are methodologies in which you need to do to in-breathe or out-breathe from, from a certain filling rate or emptying rate okay, uh, or, or in-breathing temp, from temperature degrees or out-breathing from and temperature increase all this we need to consider when we are working to fill or empty uh, a, a vessel which had which is designed to be less than 15 psi gauge okay so this is like an atmospheric tank protection uh, great so there are technologies of how to do this in breathing and i'm not going to go to the details of, of that but it, it can be calculated it's not difficult uh, but it's because that I'm not going to cover the, the details of, of these uh, of calculations here. So in breathing uh, from amber temperature decrease or increase and you have out breathing uh, from the maximum filling rate or emptying rate. Uh, so all these are just it's, it's, uh, ways of calculations. I'm not going to go through that uh, at all. So the only thing that I need to mention here, the in-breathing results is in SCFH. And, and uh, if you want to know what does SCFH stand for, uh, so this unit is 10 cubic feet per hour. Uh, and, and that is also uh, the, uh, the cubic feet per hour. So whatever, this is how it is counted. Uh, but that is the in-breathing and out-breathing. And again, we said that, that one of the overpressure uh, reasons that it could occur it could be because there's a blocked outlet and there's still there's feed continuing in okay but there's a f blocked outlet so there's an overpressure 
and, and this could be caused by downstream control valve failing uh, you see now we are going to the details of the problems so we said this is a problem but why this is happening there are also some details and those details like a control valve has a problem isolation valve closed by an operator oh sorry i closed it closed it <laughs> chemical reaction causing a flow blockage as well see that any it, anything that also could click into your mind causing this block a bl blockage right and those those sources that are pushing uh, where there's a blockage it could be a pump a compressor high pressure of a utility on upstream and but there's a blockage in front of them a, a thermal expansion could be of a solar radiation a heat exchanger you're not cooling well and and uh, there's a heating there's a, 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 instead of if, for example a valve failing and instead of closing the fuel it's, it did not close so the fuel is still entering my uh, my furnace and it's heating up so all those are generally reasons for liquid expansion and there are calculations of how to re, uh, to calculate the required relief rate depending on that thermal expansion okay but we are not going into the details of that okay but this is you can calculate how much relief rate to cap uh, and this this is all in chat the, the, the other chapter that i said that we will not cover which is chapter number 10. external fire that could be from radiant heat and 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 so on uh, what are the surfaces that sustain uh, the pool fire why because you have a fire that heats up the system so that the one the one that can sustain our concrete felt and you already know that these things how do they catch up with fire uh, walk on uh, the felt and see how if you can do that or it could be some kind of metal decks like that in which you, you can see that it will not sustain any uh, pool fire okay it will not contain it will not sustain that pool fire and uh, uh, other external fire scenarios uh, we have uh, we, we can talk more about the, 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 the other uh, surfaces is that we can have some insulations right insulations that provide any heat up of those external fire and we can also read more about uh, this API uh, standards and FPA standards. There are equations in which you can calculate the liquid vaporization, how much liquid is, vap is really vaporizing, uh, so that you can work on the drainage and fire firefighting. I'm just showing you, these are equations, I'm not going to cover those equations, I'm just showing that to you, that you can do a lot of sizing and calculating the relief rate, or how much relief rate. Again, if I have any problem with the controller, I could have a problem. And this controller, when I said I have a problem with the controller, it could be because of the instrument, a wiring failure, a mechanical piston thing, or it could be because of the DCS, the control room, the signal that they are sending, which was wrong. Uh, so it could be one of all of these. So there are many other reasons also for an automatic autom automatic control failure so please go read more about it or it could be uh, the tube broken the tube is broken right and 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 that could be because because of what it could be called because of a thermal shock heat is changing very fast and it could be because of a mechanical vibration and mechanical vibration that means if you hear the vibration in the industry you get scared i mean you cannot hear the person in front of you so imagine that this mechanical uh, shaking uh, that pipe up and down this mechanical vibration and things are not fixed well it could break it or it could be corrosion by the way sorry for that uh, i i just skipped uh, okay or it could be the corrosion uh, part I think so I skipped many uh, files here Th just a second yep so it could be co because of the corrosion uh, thing or the uh, and and or it could be because we did not do our maintenance in the right time okay and 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 a rupture could be any rupture and this is a, just an example we could have a rupture here we could have a rupture and 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 what I'm trying to do as Cooling, for example, it could be a rupture of of uh, of what is exiting here, and have a build up of liquid, and 
and we have gases here so we have more pressure so it could be a rupture from any a kind of, of a system here okay and and so on there are many uh, examples or it could be a human error okay <laughs> that is as simple as uh, someone opening or closing something that is should not be closed uh, and if you talk about human error sometimes it's because of what uh, panic huh people get panic if they have something going up and down pressure is very high temperature is high I don't know what to do I close oh my god I made a disaster okay or it could be some incorrect interpretation of when we know what are the details even of the human error we can deal with that through training okay deal with that training how to manage yourself within these conditions a chemical reactions we need to also know why do we have chemical reactions it could be because of our rate of reaction that is very complex so you need to understand that really more and get on experts who need to know how to deal with those uh, reactions utility failures i don't want to have any failure in the electrical so i need to have a generation generator a backup or a steam failure or a cooling water failure or a refrigerant failure so all these kind of utilities that could have a failure I need also to have a good maintenance not to have those kind of failures or it could be a cascading failure where there's one turbine went off and another compressor went off and then the pump went off it's like when you have a plane and then they tell you oh one of your machines went off and then another machine went off another the third machine went off why because everyone uh, every machine like uh, it, it has a certain power limit but it cannot stand a certain power limit uh, for for the whole plane and then it goes on failure and the third one goes on failure and so on or it could be the fire catching up with one and the other and so on great and of course there are uh, the, the, you need always to, uh, to, to talk about even if you think that things are, are are great you always need to say that I must use a relief device and not to take things just as face looking uh, about it and here I'm just giving some example of codes so here talking about the code for example over pressure protection by system design a pressure vessel does not require a pressure relief device if the pressure is self-limiting that is example the maximum discharge pressure of a pump over a compressor and this pressure is less than the maximum allowable uh, pressure so these are examples of standards. If you go through, read through the standards, you're going to get more and more information uh, about it. And, and or for every vessel, if you go in the industry, it's, it's different from one industry to another how that looks like. But you will have a manufacturer data report for the vessels just to know that uh, what, what is the minimum thickness, what is the allowance for corrosion, and by knowing all those kind of information, you will know how to put a relief uh, valve. And of course, you have more overprotection codes and standards and more and more. Uh, finally, there are more details in chapter number 10. If you want to go and read about it, there is a lot of uh, more complicated sources of overpressure. There's a lot of how to, to there's more about sizing and selection uh, and piping considerations that are covered in chapter number 10 but for us we have covered all the types of relief valves we have covered the scenarios uh, we have covered some standards general standards of how to use the relief valves and and we have applied these to different systems when we also went through the knockout drums and, and, and the flares and how do they uh, to deal with them till then I thank you very much uh, we have done a very good job in covering chapter number nine. I hope that you have gained a lot. This is Dr. Bassam Al Hamad teaching chemical process safety uh, by Kroll and Lover. Uh, thank you very much and all the best, Massam.